All right, good morning. Let's sing All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. It's number 12 in your hymn books. Number 12. I also want to mention special thanks to those that came and helped get some projects done here at the church yesterday. It's always great working together and it's always great seeing progress made and um, thank you to those that did that. We have Colossians 3 here, okay? You can breathe a sigh of relief that you don't have to just, you know, we've all been there when there's a group setting and you're all saying things and you don't know it so you just... You know, and you hit the last word, and you're usually late when you do that, or early, or what. I've been there, whether you have or not, I don't know. All right, here we go. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering forbearing one another and forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness, and let the peace of God rule in your heart, to which also ye are called, and be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. So great, great truths that I pray God brings back to us daily as he gives us opportunities to carry them out. And it's God's mercies that give us those opportunities and rejoice as we sing in God's mercies. I'd like to invite your attention to the overhead for the words to the song, Mercies Anew. We'll have the words for you on the overhead to mercies anew. Mm -hmm. 
Every morning that breaks their are mercies anew. Every breath that I take is your faithfulness proved. And at the end of each day, when my labors are through, I will sing of your mercies anew. Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We'd like to read the first 11 verses. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I'll begin reading in verse 1. But concerning the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman. And they shall not escape, but you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should not overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep in the night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet the hope of salvation. For the Lord did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Therefore, comfort one another with these words, just as you also are doing. Let's sing the song, When Trials Come. We'll have the words for you on the overhead. When Trials Come. When trials come no longer fearful in the pain our God draws near to fire a faith worth more than gold and there his faithfulness is told and there his faithfulness is told within the night I know 
you again to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and in this passage, Paul is addressing an issue with the believers um, regarding the Lord's return, regarding their lives. Some had been telling people that They'd missed the Lord's return and various other false teaching. And he said, I'm writing this unto you that you would, would not be ignorant of these events. And he said, you know that the Lord is going to return as a thief in the night. And he says, but it shouldn't surprise you about the Lord's return. And he used the analogy of a lady that is expecting. You don't know when the delivery will come, but it doesn't surprise you when they say that they've had a baby. If you've been around them at all, <clears throat> you expected it, but you didn't know when it would be. And he said the same is true when it comes to the return of the Lord, that it shouldn't shock us that uh, if we pay attention, um, we won't know the day or the hour. And let me say, if anyone says a day or an hour, you can mark them off as a false teacher. And also, um, there is nothing that needs to happen from Paul's time until our time and beyond that needs to happen before the Lord comes back for believers. So um, he wrote to them and he said, I'm telling you that we as believers are saved from the wrath to come. And, and being saved from the wrath to come, he said that should provide great comfort in, in our lives. So today... I'm, we're, we're going to do some things a, a little out of the ordinary here. I have a number of video clips, and basically this is what we're going to do to, to bring you alert to some of the things that are going on today in their own words. This isn't someone else saying this is what someone believes. These are all in their own words, what they are committed to, what their purpose is, then we are going to look at, not in their words, we're going to look at in God's word. What does God's word say? And then we're going to put it, okay, this is the world I'm living in. This is what God's word says. Now, in my own heart and mind, what do I need to do to appropriate all of this. I'm in this world. These are truths that apply to it. How do I apply these in my daily life? And, and how do I walk in victory? And we will spend a little bit of time in that. So I want to begin, first of all, with um, uh, this is the longest clip that we have. This is by a man who is the, the chief counsel of the World Economic Forum, and many of these clips come from um, these forums that they have. And um, he, is, he is one of the chief counsels here, and this is a, a kind of uh, collage of some of the things that he has said 
openly, it's out there. You can go find it on YouTube wherever you want. And so hopefully the volume will be up so that you'll be able to hear it and um, then we'll make some comments afterwards. Of Homo sapiens. Because in the coming generations, we will learn how to engineer bodies and brains and minds. Now, how exactly will the future masters of the planet look like? This will be decided by the people who own the data. Now, why is data so important? It's important because we've reached the point when we can hack not just computers, we can hack human beings and other organisms. Now, what do you need in order to hack a human being? You need two things. You need a lot of computing power and you need a lot of data, especially biometric data. But control of data might enable human elites to do something even more radical than just build digital dictatorships. By hacking organisms, elites may gain the power to re-engineer the future of life itself. Because once you can hack something, you can usually also engineer it. All of life for four billion years, dinosaurs, amoebas, tomatoes, humans, all of life was subject to the laws of natural selection and to the laws of organic biochemistry. But this is now about to change. Science is replacing evolution by natural selection with evolution by intelligent design. Not the intelligent design of some god above the clouds, but our intelligent design and the intelligent design of our clouds the IBM cloud, the Microsoft cloud, these are the new driving forces of evolution. And at the same time, science may enable life, after being confined to, for four billion years to the limited realm of organic compounds, science may ena enable life to break out into the inorganic realm. Humans are now hackable animals. You know, the, the whole idea that humans have, you know, this, they, they have this soul or spirit and they have free will and nobody knows what's happening inside me. So whatever I choose, whether in the election or whether in the supermarket, this is my free will, that's over. Free will, that's over. That's over. Over. Yeah. Today, we have the technology to hack human beings on a massive scale. Yeah, I mean, everything is being digitalized. Everything is being monitored. In this time of crisis, you have to follow science. It's often said that you should never allow a good crisis to go to waste because a crisis is an opportunity to also do re good reforms that in normal times people will never agree to. But in a crisis, you see we have no chance. So, 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 so let's do it. The vaccine won't help us go the to the test, The vaccine will <laughs> help us, of course. It will make things you know, more manageable. Surveillance, people could look back in 100 years and identify the coronavirus epidemic as the moment when a new regime of surveillance took over, especially surveillance under the skin, which I think is maybe the most important development of the 21st century, is this ability to hack human beings, to go under the skin, collect biometric data, analyze it, and understand people better than they understand themselves. This, I believe, is maybe the most important event of the 21st century. By hacking organisms, elites may gain the power to re-engineer the future of life itself. Because once you can hack something, you can usually also engineer it. Natural selection is replaced by intelligent design. The era of inorganic life is now beginning. In the coming decades, AI and biotechnology will give us godlike abilities to re-engineer life and even to create completely new life forms. We are about to enter a new era of inorganic life shaped by intelligent design. Our intelligent design. Before I comment on that, just a, another short clip. Um, this is Klaus Schwab at the World Economic Forum 
and he's talking about brain implants, and um, so we'll we'll have this. I can, can you imagine that in 10 years when we are sitting here, we have an implant in our uh, brains? And um, I can immediately feel, because you all will have implants. People will literally be part of a network. All the bodies, all the brains will be connected together to a network. And you won't be able to survive if you are disconnected from the net. We are probably one of the... Okay, um, the technology is all there, and there's so many things to comment on, and some of you will need to comment to your children. We haven't been here four billion years, but I'm not going to chase down every rabbit there. But the overwhelming thing of the first piece is we are gods, and, and the... Free will, that's over. And this isn't something, some Star Wars thing, some science fiction. This is the reality of their plan and their purpose in that. Of course, all of this involves um, every aspect of life. And, and again, there's so many areas. But it comes down to control. And here's... Here's a piece about um, the economic controls. <clears throat> the world order is always the financial system. Mm. I, I was very privileged. My father was an advisor to Nixon when they came off the gold standard in 71. And so I was brought up with a kind of inside view of how very important the financial structure is to absolutely everything else. And what we're seeing in the world today, I think, is we are on the brink of a dramatic change where we are about to, and I'll say this boldly, we're about to abandon the traditional system of money and accounting and introduce a new one. And the new one, the new accounting, is what we call blockchain. It means digital. It means having an almost perfect record of every single transaction that happens in the economy, which will give us far greater clarity over what's going on. It also raises huge dangers in terms of the balance of power between states and citizens. In my opinion, we're going to need a digital constitution of human rights if we're going to have digital money. Uh, but also, this new money will be sovereign in nature. Most people think that digital money is crypto and private. But what I see are superpowers introducing digital currency. The Chinese were the first. The U.S. is on the brink, I think, of moving in the same direction. The Europeans have committed to that as well. And the question is, will that new system of digital money and digital accounting accommodate the competing needs of the citizens of all these locations so that every human being has a chance to have a better life? Because that's the only measure of whether a world order really serves. So... This happened earlier this year, this summit. Friday, um, across the news feeds that I read, came this next one. This happened Friday. This is a U.S. government official talking about digital money. Um, this isn't that one. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Forward. Rapid changes are taking place in the global monetary system that may affect the international role of the dollar in the future. Most major economies already have or are in the process of developing instant 24-7 payments. Our own FedNow service will be coming online in 2023. And in light of the tremendous growth in crypto assets and stable coins, we are examining whether a U.S. central bank digital currency would improve upon what is an already safe and efficient domestic payment system. Our, as our white paper on this topic notes, a U.S. CBDC could also potentially help maintain the dollar's international standing. So, saying the dollar's in trouble, um, we need to take care of some things here, and we're moving toward, and China has, Europe has, 
Um, we're in the process of doing it. And with that, as that lady says, comes much control. Well, you can begin to see the control that's manifested just in the Canadian trucker protest that they locked down those that they deemed dangerous, locked down all their assets and everything in that regard. So um, with this always comes control. Money and control are, are the issues. And, and behind all of it is also a, an urge to control the population. And um, this next clip um, talks some about that. But in one way or another, we are so far, globally, we are so far above the population and the consumption levels which can be supported by this planet that I know in one way or another it's going to come back down. So I don't hope to avoid that. Uh, I hope that it can occur in a, a, a civil way. I, I, and I mean civil in a, in a special way. I, peaceful. Peace doesn't mean uh, that everybody's happy. But it means that conflict isn't solved through violence, through, through force, uh, but rather in other ways. And so uh, that's what I hope for, um, that we can, I mean, the planet can support something like a billion people, maybe two billion, depending on how much liberty and how much material consumption you want to, to have. If you want more liberty and more consumption, you have to have fewer people. And conversely, you can have more people. I mean, we could even have eight or nine billion, probably, if we have a very strong dictatorship, which is smart. It's, unfortunately, you never have smart dictatorships. They're always stupid. So, But if you had a smart dictatorship and a low standard of living, you can have it. But, it, but we want to have freedom and we want to have a high sentence, so we're going to have a billion people. And we're now at seven, so we have to get back down. I hope that this can be slow, relatively slow, and that it can be done in a way which is relatively equal, uh, you know, so that people share uh, the experience and you don't have a few rich, you know, trying to force everybody else to, to deal with it. So those are my hopes. I mean, these are pretty pessimistic hopes, you know, but I mean, that's, that's what lies ahead. Again, um, these are in their own words, okay? So we hear many, many terms, build back better. That isn't, a, that isn't this administration's term. That's a term that's used globally. And this is what they have in mind in building back better. We hear talk, warnings of the famines that are coming, of climate change, financial crisis, inflation, and much of it we're already experiencing. <clears throat> so um, I could probably go on all day long about various aspects, but I'm... I'm closing that. That's in their words. <clears throat> and there's many things that we could comment. And this is to, if you want pointed in directions for further information, you're welcome to it on your own. If you want help in that, I'm, I'm happy to give you some. So now we're switching gears. That's in their own words. Now in, in God's words. In God's word, it tells us that Satan has always had a desire to be God. That, that's the initial sin. I will be like the Most High. And man has adopted Satan's desire. From the Garden of Eden, you will be like God. And so man has always <clears throat> had this desire. And... It is so important for us to realize that the heart of man is evil 
and desperately wicked. And that is the fundamental difference. I mean, we, we played this clip and it just came by quick. We're currently at seven billion, so we need to get down to one billion. I mean, do you realize what that means? But throughout history, it shouldn't surprise us. Regimes have come and gone and they have killed millions of millions of people, primarily totalitarian and communist regimes, without regard for any life. And the heart of man is evil, and you put that with Satan and man's desire to be God, to act as God, and, and there is no regard for mankind if I can bring myself to power, through crushing and destroying millions or billions of people, so is it. But we need to understand, and this is our founding fathers understood, that the heart of man is evil and there needs to be boundaries on it. That's totally different what many people's philosophy is today. Now, God has already brought worldwide judgment on those attempting to be gods. In Genesis chapter 6, God brought a worldwide flood. And it was um, the danger of uh, a species in the world and doing evil continually, and it, it angered God. God has the right to be angry. He made this world. He is the only God. Those that desire to overthrow him or be like him will bring the judgment of God. There was another instance in Genesis 11 that they said, we will build a tower to God, and the whole nature of it was rebellion against God. And God said, no, you won't. And he confounded their languages, and that's why we have all the languages on the face of the earth today. And God confounded them, stopped their efforts. So, do you think that God, seeing mankind develop these abilities to say, we don't need God, we will be gods, we will design, we will control, <clears throat> do you think God is going to sit idly by? Absolutely not. So when you see the big picture of things and, and you see what is going on, then we start to understand things, and this is where it's important, from God's perspective. They're going to put up here a prophecy timeline. Andrew, is there a, a laser pointer back there? If you could bring that up. Uh, this prophecy timeline is a brief, it's the framework of what God tells us in the Bible and we'll point out here what has happened, what will happen. I'm sorry, it's not, not any bigger than that. But um, right, right here is the church age, okay? Right here is when Jesus Christ arose and the Holy, <coughs> and the Holy Spirit came. This is the church age, okay? Someday the church age is going to end when believers are caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 talks about that, right previous to what we <coughs> read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. In, in this passage, in this passage, in this time frame, it's seven years of tribulation. We don't have time to go into it. You can read about it in the book of Revelation, chapters 6 through 19. It explains what is going to happen. <clears throat> I'll, I'll briefly explain that in, in just a little bit. But I want you to get an overall framework here <clears throat> before we move on, okay? So this will be seven years of tribulation where God pours out upon the earth Two purposes, to pour out upon the earth his judgment, his wrath. The 
it, he mentions in the Bible, the, the wine press of his wrath is filled and he pours out his wrath upon mankind. That's one purpose. And the second purpose is to bring Israel back to belief. God has promised um, many promises to Israel. Many of them have not been fulfilled yet. They will be fulfilled. This uh, <clears throat> right here pictures Israel. They aren't on the main track, so to speak. The church is. Jesus Christ is going to come. The believers are caught up to be with him. The judgment seat of Christ will take place there. The marriage supper of the Lamb will also take place there. Seven years of tribulation. At the end of the seven years of tribulation, Jesus Christ returns in the battle of Armageddon. It's not a battle. He comes and wipes everything out. People say, is this the battle of Armageddon? You can guarantee to them that it's not the battle of Armageddon. The battle of Armageddon takes place after seven years of tribulations. We'll talk about that. Then God sets up a thousand year reign, 1,000 years of him reigning on earth, restoring the earth to Garden of Eden-like conditions, fulfilling the promises. The lion lays down with the lamb. They beat their swords into plowshares and so on. <clears throat> and uh, Satan is bound during that time. After, at the end of that time, he is released. He deceives many. Why is he released and deceives many? Because he, God gives everybody an opportunity of a free will to choose who they are going to follow. Many follow him. He is cast into the lake of fire. And those that do not believe are as well. And God creates new heavens and a new earth and on into eternity. That is a brief thumbnail sketch. Now, they're going to put up here a map of the tribulation period. Some of the things that God warns us about that are going to happen in the seven-year period of tribulation are found, as I mentioned, <clears throat> in Revelation 6 through 19. And I urge you to read it for yourself. And, and many people say, well, that, that's all allegorical or mystical. It's interesting. We don't think of that when God prophesied that a virgin would conceive and bring forth a son. We don't allegorize that. We don't say that's a, a mystery and, and there's secret meanings to it. So... <clears throat> In the seven-year period of tribulation, this is when believers are take, caught up to meet the Lord in the air, there will be judgment of seals, judgment of trumpets, and judgment of bowls. The, the first seals and the first three or four trumpets will take place in the first three and a half years. There will be temporary peace in Jerusalem. A temple will be rebuilt. Incidentally, Orthodox Jews have every piece of the temple already cut and ready to be put in place. The only thing they are waiting for is the ground back on the temple mount or a place to build the temple. It's all in place. It's ready. In, in, this, in this time, at the very beginning here, a world leader will be raised up, Antichrist. And he will rise to power. He will make a treaty with Israel, promising peace to all people. He will bring a great reset, which will establish a one-world government, a global economy, a one-world religion. And those that do not have his mark on their hand or their forehead will not be able to buy or sell. There will be catastrophic events that will be affected as a result of the seals and the judgments that are brought. There will be worldwide famine. There will be wars. There will be physical upheavals with earthquake. And in the first three and a half years, one-fourth of the world's population will die. The Bible tells us that. 
You can go in and read it for yourself. Midway through the seven-year period, Antichrist will enter into the Jewish temple. He will desecrate the temple. He had come along as he was at peace with Israel. He will desecrate the temple, offering a pig on the altar, and he will declare war against Israel and war against God. And there will begin blatant open persecution against Israel and against the God of Israel. Then comes in the last three and a half years, known as the Great Tribulation, there comes um, more severe judgment, boils and sores upon mankind, seas turn to blood, waters are poisoned, the sun scorches mankind, a darkness on earth, one-third of the earth's population dies. So one-fourth and one-third, that nearly brings nearly one-half of the world's population will die during this time. At the end of it, Antichrist gathers the armies of the nations to do war against Israel and God, as we mentioned, the Battle of Armageddon, which ends this period of judgment. God comes and brings judgment, and in the valley of Megiddo, the valley that Napoleon said there has never been a greater valley created for warfare and a battle than this valley. This is the valley that the battle of Armageddon will take place in, and God will be victorious and reign triumphant, and all the forces of evil will be defeated. So Jesus Christ quickly and completely defeats Antichrist and his follower, binds him, sets up the thousand-year reign that we already mentioned. Now, the only way, the only way that any person can avoid living in this tribulation period, if Christ were to come today, is by accepting the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. When a person comes to realize, I am a sinner, I am guilty of rebellion against God, and Jesus Christ alone died to pay the penalty for my sin, and we call upon Jesus Christ to forgive our sin, we become a member of God's family, and he said, as we read in 1 Thessalonians 5, we are saved from the wrath to come. We are saved and delivered from that. So it is important for us to realize that. Now, we must, we must make that, and I'll talk about it here more in just a moment, make that the focus of our life, the gospel of Jesus Christ. So it is important for us to understand the times that we live in. As I said earlier, there are no signs that need to happen before this happens. But what we played earlier today is all the mechanisms of what's going to take place in the early part and throughout the tribulation. Controlling mankind, buying, controlling their buying and selling, um, all of those things. If all of those things are in place, they're there in the future, it surely would indicate a strong possibility that the Lord's return is near. Now, I understand God is sovereign. We may look at it like the Lord's return is near, even as Paul did in his day 2,000 years ago. And it was near, near in his day. But we are so much nearer. It could be today, it could not be for another hundred years. I don't know God's mind. If I was a betting man and I had to bet closer to zero or closer to a hundred years, I'd bet closer to this end, okay? But I'm not a betting man, I'm not setting dates. I'm, I'm saying it ought to make us wake up and realize, number one, things aren't going to go back the way they were. They never are, they won't. Okay? I mean, these are things that are, that are in place. 
So in my mind, in my life, how do I live? Number one, you better make sure you're a child of God and there better be no doubts about it. I mean, we, we are talking the most horrific events that have ever happened on the face of this earth will be happening in that seven-year period of time. And if the Lord comes in your lifetime and you are not a child of God, you will be living and perhaps dying in that period. And it is important. The only way to avoid it is through faith in Jesus Christ. Not joining a church, not going to church, not getting baptized. I am a sinner. I need forgiveness. And I know only Jesus Christ can forgive sin and to call upon him. So, number one, make sure you are a child of God. Number two, you must build your faith in the word of God. You must immerse yourself to know God's word, to know God's promises, to know God's plan, to know the truth of God so you can appropriate his grace, to know the promises of God, memorize scripture, and live the truth. Not just get it here, live it out of our lives. Colossians, put on meekness, humbleness of mind, long-suffering, forbearing one another, living the truth out of our lives. I mean, we have no idea when the Lord may come or when I may keel over and die, all right? And so I want to be walking with God. I want to be walking in the truth. So make sure you're a child of God. Build your faith in the Word of God. We must become students of the Word much more than we've ever been before. Thirdly, we need to proclaim the gospel. Listen, we have relatives, we have friends, we have neighbors, co-workers, that if the Lord comes soon, will be living in this time. As I said, the most horrific time ever to face this earth. And you, as a believer, have the cure so that they can avoid the wrath to come, as he said. And you can take comfort in that. So it's important that we proclaim the gospel. There's nothing more selfish than thinking, I'm, I'm good to go and just come, Lord, come and get me. We have a responsibility, the Great Commission. And so we must speak the truth in love. The gospel, we must speak the truth as it relates to the gospel and in every other area. You know, it's important for us to, to stand and do what is right. Communism is an enemy of God. It's an enemy of the gospel. And it's something that we need to fight. The number one thing is to proclaim the gospel. The number two thing is to, to fight to, to be able to do the number one thing. And we're living in a day today that wants to quickly take away the number one thing. Of, of doing that. So it's speaking the truth in love. This next one, number five, prepare to suffer. <clears throat> and you know what? I don't know when the Lord is coming again. And it, it's immaterial because Paul told the believers in his day, and God told his, Jesus Christ told his followers, that in the world you will have tribulation. So, We've had a mentality that Christ will make life better and make it easy. No, you're in a warfare. You need to gird your loins up with truth. You need to be ready to battle. You need to be ready to suffer. And all throughout our Christian history, all throughout biblical history, individuals have been willing to suffer because they love God more than they love this life. And it is a mentality. It's not, why am I suffering? It's suffering is a very real fact of life. All that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. We have been pretty spoiled here in the U.S. And, and I'm not saying that derogatorily. Thank God for it. But that is probably coming to an end. 
And that's one of the reasons our, our next series on Sunday morning will be dealing with this whole doctrine of suffering. What does the Bible say about suffering? And our study on Sunday night. Um, it's a struggle. Life is a struggle. So prepare to suffer. And how do you do that? By the other four things I said earlier. Then how do I put all this together? I honor God by serving others. I build relationships in this life, and I try to help other believers, encourage them in the battle. I try to help bring people to Christ, and I help them to be prepared so they can avoid the wrath that is to come. And then lastly, I give thanks. As a believer, I give thanks. God promises in 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 10 that his grace is sufficient. He didn't say our, our retirement fund would be sufficient. He didn't say our health would be sufficient. He didn't say our government would be sufficient. He said his grace is sufficient. Hebrews 13, 5, he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. We give thanks. God, no matter what comes in this life, God is with us. We rejoice in Romans chapter 8. Nothing can separate me from the love of God. Can tribulation or distress or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No, in all these things we are overwhelmingly conquerors through Jesus Christ. It isn't like, oh, things are going to be bad and they're bringing digital this and all. Those we need to be aware of. But whatever they do, Stephen, stone, and with joy he looked up at the Father because he realized nothing can separate me from the love of Christ. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 9, rejoice, we are saved from the wrath to come. Therefore, he said, verse 11, comfort each other and build up one another just as you are also doing. So he's saying, give thanks, the best is yet to come. And, and we rejoice in that. And so the, the focus should always be on God. What do you want me to do? These are, these are incredible times that we have the privilege to live in. I mean, Israel is the focal point of God's work. And it is important for us to realize that we are seeing happen before our eyes the very things that he said in the word of God. And so it shouldn't cause us to be downhearted. We should give thanks. We should rejoice. And these are truths that we need to personalize and we need to make known to those that we know and love and rejoice together. Let's bow together in prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for truth. I thank you that we have copies of your word. I thank you that you are sovereign, that you are in control, and that we can trust you for every detail of life. And Lord, I thank you that you have offered to us freedom from the penalty of sin, freedom from the power of sin, and someday freedom from the presence of sin, all through faith in Jesus Christ alone. And Lord, I pray for individuals here today that may not be 100% sure that they're a child of you. Lord, I pray today before they leave that they would settle that by calling unto you for the forgiveness of sins. God, be merciful to me, a sinner, and save me. And Lord, if they'd like someone to, to help them, I pray they'd mention that before they leave here today. Lord, eternity is at stake. And God, I pray that your spirit would draw hearts to you even today. And Lord, I pray for everyone that's a believer. I pray that you would cause us to have a faith that is anchored deep in you and your word. 
I pray that we would be living out the truths of your word, that our lives would be given to you and serving others, and Lord, that our faith would not fail. I pray that everyone would finish strong the race that you've set before us by looking unto you, the author and finisher of our faith. So Lord, thank you that you are the author of history. Thank you that we can rejoice in who you are and what you're going to do and rejoice that nothing can separate us from the love of you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.